This podcast is brought to you by Spice Rum devotees Baron Samadhi. Like us, they share a desire for a vibrant and thriving nightlife and celebrate the creativity that only comes to life after dark. Hey, you're listening to the Stony Roads podcast. I'm Andrew Cobman. When a track goes viral online, it changes the lives of the artists that made it. But because no one knows exactly what makes a track go viral, they're rarely prepared for what comes next. The instant stardom can leave artists as a one-hit wonder or push them into long-lasting careers. Public expectations can eat away at their creativity or they can move forward with their vision undeterred. The latter is the path Sydney duo Yolanda Be Cool took. To celebrate its 10-year anniversary, we're bringing you the story behind Yolanda Be Cool and D-Cup's 2010 hit, We No Speak Americana. It sold over 5 million copies, was watched over 200 million times on YouTube, and went to number one in 16 countries. We spoke to the duo to find out how the track came about, what happened after it blew up, and what they learned from their crazy experience. They came through with huge lessons for musicians looking for any kind of success. We also asked them why they think the track went crazy and how other artists could do the same. And yeah, we know we're not going to get to the bottom of what makes a track go viral. As Matt told us, if we knew, everyone would be doing it. Making a viral track can't be summarized into steps, but in popular music, there are always patterns. A few clear boxes that Americano ticked. In this episode, we want to think about what they were. Andrew Stanley and Matthew Hanley both grew up in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. They surfed at the same beaches and eventually met at the Paddington Green Pub on Oxford Street around 2002. While Matt was DJing, Andy was passing drinks to him behind the decks and they became quick mates. As the story goes, Matty liked the killer and so did I. Turns out they both had a passion for underground house music and Andy was looking to learn how to DJ, so Matt showed him what was what. After realising they were buying a lot of the same records, they started DJing back to back, releasing bootlegs and eventually forming a duo. At that time, they were going by the Vandals and were on the hunt for a new name. Well, the... The reference is obviously Pulp Fiction, the dinosaur, and be cool, honey bunny, you land to be cool. We were just looking for a name, and I remember just when my wife was driving very erratically, I go, hey, be cool, honey bunny, you land to be cool, slow down, you know what I mean? Like, just chill out, you're going to kill us. You land to be cool, stuck, yeah. At you land to be cool's afternoon DJ sets, they noticed a smooth Italian jazz track was getting punters out of their seats, and it became the foundation of their breakout single. Our good friend Sammy, her dad had a CD called Best of France and Best of Italian, and she gave that to us, yeah, and the original was always just perfect for, like, pool bars and... You know, there was a place in Ivy called The Den that we used to play it. And, and even the original still sounds cool, you know. It's really slow. It's 90 BPM. But The Den was a bar in Ivy. We used to play at Ivy Pool, like, but it first, first opened. Like, so, at, like, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, people just used to always get up, even for the original. So then, And then Maddie said, what do you think of this? I was like, oh, fuck, I, I love that. It had some magic. <laughs> Around 2008, Matt was working at record label Sweated Out. He just co-founded the new business venture alongside Jamie Rayburn and DJ Ajax, who you can hear more about in Season 1, Episode 3 of this podcast. Matt was sent some disco bootlegs from producer Duncan McLennan, also known as d Sweated Out wasn't really pushing disco at the time, but Ajax knew it was too good to pass up. So they set up a meeting and released the tracks. D-Cup's first collab with label bodies you land a bit cool went all right, to say the least. Basically, at the time, Reva Star, I was drunk, had just come out. Like, I think we all thought that was like such an incredible song. And um, basically, we tried to make that, <laughs> our version of that. And then... Um, played that to the cop and he loved it and then he was like yeah let's get in the studio together. Matty came up with a really good groove but it was more of an underground sort of uh, tech housey rolling groove and then we thought well this track could be more than that and then that's when we went over to D Cups and we chucked it in the sampler and, and chopped it up and all we wanted to do was like finish it bounce it send it to Ajax you know and then he 
he liked it straight away, didn't he? Yeah, which was rare because he would always have so many changes. With Ajax's tick of approval, we know Speak Americano was ready to go. Just before the 2010 release, the boys were sending out the track to their favourite international DJs. The response from their crowds was a good look into what was to come. I remember, like, we said it to um, Ali Oop to play at Electric Circus. And she goes, yeah, it ran, ran, ran really well. We gave her a very early version. We just gave it to our mates to play. And I guess that's sort of how it started. When we we sent it to Reva Star, as soon as we finished it, because we thought we'd love to hear what he thought. And he said, and he tweeted out, oh, my God, someone just sampled this song that my mother used to play while I was cooking as a kid. And he posted the original, like, you know, Renato Carasoni's version. Um, and then we obviously sent it to Mowgli. And I guess we were just, so there was that one video, and I think it was at Solo and Roundtable Nights playing it at their club. Mowgli, remember, was at, what was their club called in Switzerland? Do you mean Burn? Yeah, their club, their club. What was it called? Um... Anyway, we got a video back of all of our favourite producers playing it and dancing around. And it was like, oh, my God, so this is sort of... People did it. That was a goal, you know, to get underground producers playing it. But then obviously it took off and had a life of its own. But it started off in a cool club. <laughs> Andy remembered the first time he realised things were about to get crazy. We had some dude hit us up, didn't we? And I remember Matt, I said, Matt, we've got this weird Facebook message. And he said, dude, what is this song? I've had it on repeat. The DJ played it. He was from Latvia. He goes, man, the DJ played it. I've been making love to it all night. I've listened to it rock <laughs> around the track. Yeah. What the fuck is this? And we were like, hold on, how the hell? I mean, we've got two dudes in Bondi and some dude in um, Latvia hitting us up out of the blue. How does he even have this song? That was quite strange. From there, they said the rise of We No Speak Americano came in stages. Stage one was um, when it went to number one on Beatport and then we're like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, like we went from having Ajax love it to having like, like Andy was saying, Roundtable Nights and Mowgli and Solo and Zombie Disco Squad and that was enough for us. And then, and then I think the next stage after that, which wasn't too long after, was like... I guess radio stations started playing it and then it like I think it got pretty big in Australia first. I think Triple J Yeah, Triple J got on it. That was the most played track on Triple J and uh, most requested and you know for uh, the short period of time that Triple J played it our uh, stuff and then obviously it crossed over to Nova then it was I don't didn't get a number one here did it? The big moment was like when we were touring and then it was like you need to go to the, do this interview it's about to go number one in the UK and it's like the last time Aussie Act went number one in the UK was um, Peter, Andre. Peter Andre. So I was like, okay, we've got to do this interview. And like, it all just sort of happened. Like, that was when things were going crazy. We Know Speak Americano launched Yolanda B. Cool's career in a huge way. Incredible opportunities came their way that they're extremely grateful for. But on the flip side, Matt and Andy say that the expectations of the masses were difficult to manage. They were often put in front of crowds that didn't know or care for their underground house roots. We didn't even mean to set out to have a hit. So when we did, sometimes promoters expected us to be commercial DJs and we're not really that commercial at all. Like our passion is completely underground house music. Like we always say we like to make accidental hits or we like songs that are accidentally big, but quite often we'd find ourselves in venues where maybe the crowd thought, oh, well, if they made a song that's on the radio, then they must play songs on the radio, whereas for the most part we didn't even listen to the radio. And that's the mystery of viral tracks. Matt and Andy knew they had a great song on their hands, but they never could have predicted its mass appeal. In fact, they thought the complete opposite. Matt remembered a festival slot before Americano's release where they didn't even play it because they didn't think it was a festival tune at all. In my head, I was thinking, if it's not busy, I'll test it out, you know? And what was the response like? Well, I think (laughs) it was really busy, so I don't think I played it. (laughs) (laughs) So I I don't even know if I played it. I think I played another one of our songs that came out after. It was really busy, so you didn't play Windows Speaker (laughs) or Ricardo because you didn't want to clear it. I think the honest truth is, like, in our heads, we thought it was a cool party jam. We didn't think it was, like, a 2,000-person festival tune, you know? Um, We thought it was like by the pool with your mates, having a laugh. Definitely didn't even cross our minds (laughs) that it was a hit. We just thought it was a cool song that we just hoped Ajax would love it. Just before the making of Americano, they'd made a track called Villalobos for Presidente. 
It's sort of a love song dedication to Ricardo Villalobos, a minimal techno producer they'd seen in Ibiza. It was like a six minute song, which isn't even that long, but it was for Ajax. And he gave us this kind of chat like, guys, you know, like, I want you to be bigger than this. Like, you know, and we were like, what do you mean? All these cool DJs are playing that, which was kind of true because it did have some cool DJs play it. But the point of my story is he told us to make something more party. And I guess that's how we also got to Americano as we were thinking, okay, let's make something more party. Yolanda Be Cool didn't head into the studio with d expecting to make a song with 200 million streams that day. Because of that, hindsight is all they have. So looking back, what do they think We Know Speak Americano did differently to send it viral? They think it might be how the mix of musical styles appealed to every generation. Now I've got kids, there's definitely something, if you can make little kids dance, it may not be the coolest track, but it's definitely, you're making something with mass appeal. And I think the the amount of times people saying, oh, that's my kid's favourite song or whatever. I mean, not that we go in the studio and think, geez, we want to make a song for toddlers. But I think the fact that it had, it must have mass appeal or or, or super catchy or some type of earwormy thing that then that crosses over that makes people from all ages like it. Maybe that was it because it it resonated with old people because they're like, oh, you know, I used to make pasta with my family around the kitchen to that song. To you, a three-year-old kid that just, like, doesn't know what he's listening to but likes it, you know? As music lovers, we all know how complex music production is, even for tracks that might sound simple. But the Yolanda boys point to that simplicity as a reason for Americana success. Fun beats, done well. It's definitely got, like, a, I guess, like, an infectious energy about it as well that just puts people in a good mood. And obviously the horn is kind of dumb, <laughs> dumb enough for in a good way to be like just people can latch onto it I guess and then maybe it's that little silence you know before before the drop where it's got the as it became known in like South America Papa Americano we, we obviously we've worked with a lot of really talented producers musicians and what we have definitely realized is that you don't need to be the best instrumentalist to make the catchiest stuff in fact it's quite often it's the opposite it's like you know the best pianist might overplay it and make it more interesting but not as catchy if you know what i mean like dun, 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 sort of neanderthal it's simple and um at the dumb hook yeah Americano is built around samples, chopped and sliced from Renato Carasone's 1956 Italian jazz track to Vuo Fa Le Americano. Forgive us on the pronunciation. In the whirlwind success, Matt and Andy forgot a critical part of the release process. Clearing your samples. Producers, we don't recommend trying this at home. I, I guess, like, at the time, we were under, a, obviously, a misapprehension that, <laughs> you know, because if you look at B-Pod, sometimes you're like, wow, no one really cares about samples. And and obviously, we like to think we've learned the hard way, but we were just like, well, it's just a party song. It's fun, you know. And, and it was also such an old song. It was, like, from 1956. So, essentially, it was, like, nearly at that point where you didn't even need to care anyway but it wasn't at that point as we found out once it went to number one and then I guess what happened was Jamie who's the other business partner in Sweated Out he started getting calls from labels wanting to sign the record and that's when he was like oh we better clear it hey guys and yeah so I guess he went to Universal, who owned the publishing, and they said, yeah, you, you can clear it, but we'll take 100% of the income. That's 100% of the publishing income. Based on general industry regulations, you land to be cool would still be making money off the master side. Whenever the track is used in ads, TV shows, or movies, Universal Music takes 50% of the total income because they own all of the publishing rights. You land to be cool and all their stakeholders split the other 50%. The master side. We always joke that we wanted to go and find Renato Carasoni's grandchildren and ask them to buy us a beer because they probably made a lot of money off us. And then basically the same thing with, I'm pretty sure it's Universal Recordings as well. We had to clear it with them. So yeah, it's all cleared. <laughs> Just, you, but you never know because maybe we tried to clear it and they were like, oh, we've never heard of you guys denied. And then maybe the song never would have happened. 
Um, I mean, look, we, we were thieves. We should have been punished. But, look, we could have a nicer house if we had been a bit more forward thinking, I guess. But, you know, it is what it is. I, I honestly hope that Renato's children have a nice house. With the insane popularity, sales and the use of the track worldwide, it's hard not to see this for what it is. A pretty rough financial loss. But Yolanda Be Cool took it in their stride, learnt from their mistakes and moved forward. Again, producers, always clear your samples through the proper channels. Considering this situation, we wanted to know how the payouts break down. And they actually gave it to us. We asked Matt and Andy if a feature film paid $100,000 to use We No Speak Americano after it passes through all the stakeholders, how much would they make? Here's their estimation. I can tell you, okay, maybe this is a good indication of how much we get. So I remember there was a film, right, that let's just say it was 100 grand and it came from America, right? So instantly the American label takes half. So that's 50 gone, right? So then it goes to the Australian label and then that takes half, right? So then it's down to 25 and then there's three dudes. So I guess like out of 100 grand, we would get eight grand each. As a musician, you're always reaching for the track that could change everything. But you might not realise you found it until it blows up. So based on this story, consider treating every track like it's the one. Make something true to yourself and then release it right. So you get the results you deserve and don't get screwed over. You can read up on copyright, sampling and publishing regulations on the APRA AMCOS website. That's apraamcos.com.au and links to resources will be in the episode description. As of today, my clients who want to be cool, the creators of We Know Speak Americano are issuing an international product recall of the aforementioned song because the beats are no longer fresh. You're hearing a clip from 2012's We No Speak Americano product recall video. As they were about to launch their debut album, Ladies and Mentalmen, Matt and Andy accepted that Americano was no longer in their hands. It had taken on a life of its own through the internet. They were proud and grateful for the success of the track, but they felt it was time to put it to rest. It took on a life of its own. At the start, all our favourite DJs were playing it, and then fast forward a couple of years, it was like it's a a meme video on cat videos. Once it got to that point, we decided it needed to be retired from our DJ sets. And also our musical taste sort of evolved and it just sort of stood out like a sore thumb. So we just thought, let's just retire it for a little while. The internet was a huge part of We No Speak Americano's rise. And in 2020, the role the internet plays in viral tracks has only grown. At the time of this recording, seven out of the top 10 tracks on the ARIA singles chart blew up on social media platform TikTok. Although Americano is the soundtrack to thousands of TikTok videos, you won't find Matt and Andy on there. In the age of TikTok, isn't it like something you can choreograph a dance to? It seems like that. I don't want to get in, involved with TikTok. We signed out at Snapchat. We didn't even get into Snapchat. But My girlfriend was playing a song this morning and I was like, oh, you know, this is like number one in Australia. And she goes, yeah, it's a TikTok hit. <laughs> The other weird thing is the gaming stuff, like Marshmallow just played on Fortnite or whatever. Like I was chatting to Matt before, I was like, what, what's actually going on here? Like, don't you want to just go to a club, get all sweaty, hug your mates, dance around, meet new people, like fall in love for a night, meet friends. That's, I don't want to do that on a, in, a, in a game, but like it's all pretty strange, don't you think? This year, Yolanda Be Cool is celebrating We No Speak Americano's 10-year anniversary. Since its release, they've travelled the world, created plenty more hits, released two albums and are still playing huge sets around Sydney and abroad. Beyond the cat memes and the bad dancers, we hope this episode helped you remember We Know Speak Americano and you land to be cool for what they really are. Absolutely legendary. This podcast was recorded at Forbes Street Studios in the heart of Sydney. It's created by Andrew Cotman and David Ross. Written and researched by Emily Carmona. Our audio engineer and producer is Dan McHugh. Thanks again to Baron Samity Spiced. Rum Resurrected.